Hello and welcome. Um, it gives me uh, an incredible amount of pleasure to introduce our uh, guest speaker for today, uh, Professor Khaled Malas. Um, Khaled Malas is an architect and an art historian from Damascus. Um, he's a PhD candidate at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts and an Urban Democracy Lab Fellow at the Galatin School of Individualized Study. Um, Khaled is also the co-founder of Sigil, an architecture-based uh, uh, design collaborative in Beirut New and New York City, um, collectively titled Monuments of Everyday Sigil's Projects Embark on Committed Inquiries regarding um, the relations between radical built gestures, the role of narrative and design, and attempts to challenge ongoing violence by evoking transmutational hope. This work has been widely exhibited, published, and collected. Recent commissions include those at the 2019 Milan Design Triennale and the 2019 Biennale um, in New Orleans. Um, but also every possibly every Biennale or Triennale one can possibly imagine, uh, Sigil's work has been widely um, uh, exhibited and um, very well received. Um, Khaled is a member of the Arab Image Foundation, the Lewis Carroll Society of North America, and um, the Syrian Studies Association. Uh, the latter awarded Sigil's Bird Song an honorable citation in their 2019 book prize. And it's an incredible book. I highly recommend it. Um, and I must also say on a more personal note that uh, Khaled is a dear friend. Um, I'm immensely happy that he can join us today. And um, a couple of years back when I was visiting him in Dubai, we both realized what can be termed only as um, sort of a, a rudimentary moment of intersectional thinking, where we realized that while I could understand how Urdu sounds, I couldn't read it because I could re re only read a Devnagri script. And um, Khaled being an Arabic speaker could somehow read um, Urdu, but not understand it. So between Khaled and I, we somehow have one language uh, the language of Urdu between us. And, um, and again, um, it gives me an immense amount of joy uh, to have Khaled here today. And really um, what, the, what, what, what Khaled's work, what the work of Sigil shows us is that um, such modes of uh, intersectional thinking, um, new imaginations um, for um, our current moment in time and new modes of solidarity are not only incredibly important, but are also beautifully possible. So thank you, Khaled, for joining us. And please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much, Saroj, for such a generous introduction. Um, I have much to say, including how our shared comprehension of Urdu doesn't mean that we understand anything better than we do in any other language, because you and I are both completely lost when it comes to trying to comprehend the world around us. I also want to point out that the, the, the Binale we participated in was at Orléans, which is the old Orleans rather than the new Orleans. My apologies. And, um, but um, I'm very, very, very happy to be here, whatever here happens to be on this very funny format. I would first like to start by thanking Sumaila Pula and all the faculty at the Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture. I also obviously want to thank you and Khuzer Lagari and all the participants in your class, the forms of resistance. I've been very, very jealous, as I mentioned earlier today, of everybody who's taking your class and you're all very lucky to have Sarosh as your tutor. Um, so as I was saying, the format is particularly strange and I find myself speaking to you in this very cold, rainy New York morning. And uh, I suspect I'm beamed into a very beautiful Karachi afternoon, and, but I hope we can make this work together. I've unfortunately never been to Pakistan yet and I trust I'll have the opportunity to visit all of you soon. I'm very thrilled to be here. 
So, um, as Sarash mentioned, I'm an architect by profession. That is my original training, and I'm now training to be an art historian. Since 2014, I have co-founded and led Sejil, which is a multidisciplinary collective based in Beirut, New York City, in which we practice as artists, designers, historians, and architects. Um, I'm primarily, uh, there is a core group, which is Sejil, which includes Selim al Adi, who's an architect in Beirut, Jana Trabulsi, who is a graphic designer in between Beirut and Marrakesh, and Alfred Tarazi, an artist based in Beirut. In Sejil, we truly believe that architecture must transcend the often unquestioned distinction between buildings and monuments and the everyday and, and, and the spectacle. And I am hoping to show you four projects today. I realize I did not share my screen. So let's begin that now. Just a quick uh, note here um, as Khaled is sharing his screen. Uh, for everyone joining us, can you um, bear in mind that there are two little windows, one chat and one Q&A. And um, we very much welcome uh, you to ask questions under the Q&A window, but please put them down as, as they come up um, and not right at the very end. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Sarosh. So this is the group, Salim. I, I wonder if you can see my mouse, but that is Salim Al-Adi, architect in Beirut, Alfred Tarazi, artist in Beirut, Jana Trabulsi, um, graphic designer and illustrator based in between Be Beirut and Marrakesh, and yours truly, hiding in the shadows. So the four projects I will show you today are all from Syria, and they are excavating the sky, current power in Syria. The revolution is a mirror, or also hashtag the revolution is a mirror, and birdsong. These projects collectively are known as the monuments of the everyday, and they are a response to the violence that has been publicly escalating in Syria since 2011. As, is, as I hope it is very clear from our project, this violence is not new, but is one with, that is deeply embedded within both the historical and the modern experience, whether in Syria or in elsewhere. And I hope that you might be able to draw some parallels between what is happening or has happened in Syria and your own experiences in Pakistan. As such, monuments of the everyday constitute our immediate and articulate responses to this violence. Although I must probably add that many of these responses are also uh, quite naive sometimes. All of the work that we do together is done in collaboration with other interlocutors and partners in Syria and beyond. And I feel it's best to begin by acknowledging the people that we work with. These are primarily Zaydun al-Zarbi and the Higher Commission for Civic Defense in Daira in South Syria, a group that no longer exists, unfortunately. Yassin al-Bushi and Abu Ali al-Qalamuni in the Damascus Ghulta, and Amir Ibrahim, Imad Maddah, and the Fatih Mudayya Center for Art and Culture in the occupied town of Majd al-Shams in the occupied Golan Heights, which I will always refer to in Arabic as the Jolan, and not the more common English Golan Heights. This presentation, my monologue, will be interrupted by, by seven students and Sarosh, who will be reading excerpts from the books that we have produced together at Sijin. In many ways, I'm trying to experiment as we all are now with this uh, format of Zoom. And being that it's very, very strange, I feel that it might be interesting to somehow try to shake, shake it up a little bit. If it works, it'd be great. If not, I'll know to never do this again. In the end, I hope that I'll answer some questions and then we'll take a short break and then I'll sort of reconvene with Sarosh and the students of this class. So we'll start by talking about excavating the sky. Zahra, can you please read your text? Yes. In response to the Great Syrian Revolt of 1925, French mandate forces heavily bombard the Syrian landscape from the air, resulting in hundreds of deaths. In Damascus, a targeted medieval neighborhood to this day retains the name Harika, Harika the Blaze. It is conspicuous on the day plan by its gridded streets surrounding an etoile, an omnipresent testament to the continuities between modern planning practices and technologies of war, fire, the second element from excavating the sky. Thank you. 
In Excavating the Sky, we examined the role of heavy mechanical flight as an exemplary modern experience of space and space making, specifically in the production of the Syrian landscape. Committed to the marvelous potential of architecture, our intervention takes the form of a single building gesture, a well. In fact, we eventually built two wells. With our collaborators in Daira, we built two wells in southern Syria, in an area outside of regime control and governed by local councils, popular assemblies, and murderous militias. The wells provide potable water for the population that has been in operation since the summer of 2014. So what I want you to imagine that these two wells have been in Daira, in the villages surrounding Daira and the Daira government in southern Syria for the last six years. Uh, they are almost impossible to see from the sky and they provide water for 27,000 people every day. The water basically comes out of people's taps. People don't actually access the well directly. They temporarily replace the infrastructure that was destroyed by war. At the 2014 Venice Biennale of Architecture, we proposed an architectural subversion, channeling Venice-related funds and publicity to the building of our displaced pavilion in Syria, namely the well. Representations of this well were then shown in Venice in the form of this banner. Venice was also the setting for multiple curated events, film screenings, symposia, and um, sort of like round table discussions that critically sought to examine the role of aerial observation and bombardment in the production of modern space. If the sky represents the powerful attempts to produce territory from above, the well is this power inverted and resisted, glaring upwards, capable of raising hopes from the very depth of the earth. It is also oblivious because of its size to violent attempts to destroy it from above. The well is 120 meters deep and it's only 6.35 centimeters in plan, so, you know, tiny, and it's 120 meters deep. As such, it is almost impossible to see from the sky, let alone to bomb. That is the size of the well as it's displayed on the cover of our book. The archeological analogy alluded to in excavating the sky reminds the reader that the sky, like the gods and the flying machines that inhabit it, is a construct. In this project, we narrate four stories of power falling from the sky, each of one of them conceptually understood to be reflecting one of the four elements. So the first story is that of air, which is the story of the first airplane to penetrate Syrian skies in 1914. And then its subsequent dramatic faith, uh, fate. This airplane was part of a propaganda project by the Ottoman Empire just in the, in the, in the months leading up to the First World War. The second story is fire, which is the story of the first urban carpet bombing in history. So the first carpet bombing ever to occur happened in Damascus in 1925. And this is the story that we try to tell in this particular chapter, which is the one that also Rashmin alluded to. The third story is that of Earth, which is the story of a 1987 cosmonaut, a Syrian cosmonaut, and his live conversation from the Soviet state station meet, uh, with our former dictator Hafez al-Assad. The fourth element, water, is a story of a barrel bomb that falls into a toilet in a field in northern Syria. This happened in 2014 and it was commemorated in a scathological poem that was then um, uploaded online onto YouTube. Anas? Yes. In 1987, Lieutenant Colonel Mohammad Ahmed Fars from the Syrian Air Force participates in a Soviet intercosmos mission to the Mir space station. In orbit, he conducts a live televised conversation with President Hafez al-Assad in which he describes the landscape of Syria. The moment is celebrated as one of the extraordinary triumph in the stars. Upon descent, the colonel is decorated with medals and the event is commemorated on stamps and other similar memorabilia, symbolically sealing the historic alliance between the peoples of the USSR and the SAR. As for Lieutenant Colonel Fars, he returns to his city of Aleppo, continues his military career, and is soon publicly forgotten until he announces his defection in the August 2012 
following the first documented bombing by fixed wing aircraft by the regime of its own populace. Earth, the third element from excavating the sky. Thank you. Air, fire, earth and water. In our project, the architecture is conceived as an alchemical gesture, namely the knowledgeable manipulation of the elements to produce gold. In this case, a life supporting infrastructure, that of the well. This occurs within the wasteful expenditure of the war and the possibilities of, poss of popular revolt. Rushmi. Rushmi. Often framed as a poignant critique of Arab regimes from an everyday citizen's perspective, yet endlessly broadcast on Syrian state television. In the 1979 play entitled Kasa Kya Watan, uh, Cheers O Nation. The play stars the most famous cast of Syrian comedians, including the beloved tramp Hawar Al Tosh. Midway through the performance, Hawar is arrest arrested and led to a torture cell with two men menacing officers. Denied any form of self representation, he is restrained onto a chair and is interrogated before the audience using an excessive plethora of cruel methods all of which he manages to successfully subvert, the audience erupting in liberating and somewhat defiant applause, delight, and laughter. When the officers choose to, do, when the officers choose to electrocute him through the butter, it is he that bellows in roaring laughter. Forced to explain himself, he comments that electricity has arrived into his behind long before it has arrived to his village. The officers stand dumbfounded before resuming their cruelty. Torture 1979, the fourth episode from Current Power in Syria. Thank you. So Current Power in Syria is our second project. And it's a project that examines the role of electricity in the production of the modern nation state. It is an act of creative resistance, one that takes power literally. In June 2015, in collaboration with a photographer and a blacksmith, an eight meter high windmill was erected in the besieged Damascus suburb of Arbin and the Huta. The blacksmith had developed a series of electromechanical devices designed to provide alternative sources of power for his community. These were a set of norias, or naura in Arabic, I don't know what the Urdu would be, which are water wheels that are able to convert using a very complex gear system, the slow revolution of a wheel placed in an abandoned agricultural canal that now had running sewage into the necessary velocity to generate electric power. The technology of this norias were adapted towards our own research and development windmill, the first of its kind in the Wuta. I'm going to play a short video here that was made by Yasin El Bushi, our collaborator, who was an architecture student then, who is now a proud architect. And um, he was using his camera to document the life and death of what was happening around him during this very difficult time. He eventually started selling the footage of what he was and the and the images of his uh, community to various news outlets. And I would like to show you something that he, um, his own documentations of the Norias that he did prior to, uh, just before we built our windmill. There is almost no sound in this video except for a very small dialogue in the end where the man describes uh, the action of the Norias and the production of electricity. I'm 
Um, I always find that extremely moving as a video. Um, I just want to point out to all the architects who are in the room or um, in the Zoom, so to, sp so to speak, is that how those norias are actually built out of metal scrap. These are people who are under um, very heavy bombardment and what can only be described as a siege uh, where no material is allowed in and out. And so they've actually, um, I don't know what Sarosh, the term that Sarosh would use, but they've recycled, upcycled, uh, adopted, adapted these different fragments of that are both architectural but all are also scrap metal scrap into the production of these norias and the windmill later on um it's just something to reflect on because uh, i feel that there's a lot of educational value in that so i apologize to sort of like bring that up midway so for those unfamiliar with the geography of damascus the eastern and western Wulta are the orchards that once surrounded the city over the course of the last century, the Eastern Ghulta in particular has been transformed into a series of mostly low-income, residential, industrial, and also agricultural suburbs. Prior to 2011, the region was home to perhaps 2 million people. It should come as no surprise that its residents were at the vanguard of the popular uprising against the Assad regime since the very first weeks of the revolution in 2011. For this, the landscape and its people were violently punished. The Eastern Wulta was the site of the two alleged chemical attacks in 2013 and 2018. Follow ye following years of indiscriminate shelling, airstrikes, and barbaric starvation tactics of the roughly 400,000 people who were trapped inside the, the Eastern Wulta, in April of 2018, the area was finally seized by regime forces and their Russian and Iranian-backed allies. Today's population is estimated to be around 250,000, following the death and displacement of a population that survived nine years of bloodshed. Between June 2015 and June 2017, this windmill was used to generate electric power for an underground field hospital. It, it was a field hospital of 60 beds. Representations of this, of this project were shown at the Marrakesh Art Biennale in the spring of 2016, where we designed a three meter high device in an early modern pleasure pavilion. This is it. I want to somehow walk you through it to somehow give you an idea about the architecture, the existing architecture, and then our somewhat shy uh, intervention within it. I very much enjoy sharing this particular image of the Pleasure Pavilion in Marrakesh. In many ways, the landscape in which this pavilion is placed is very comparable to what the Ruta once was. It is also an acute reminder of the severe disconnect, regardless of our best intentions, between the multiple sites of our interventions. Uh, what I need to somehow point out is that in, in three of the four monuments of the everyday projects that I will show you today, of which this is the second, we often have a, a book um, and built intervention in Syria and then uh, an exhibition usually in the global north, or in this case in Marrakesh. And these three components of the projects are supposed to operate in sync to one another to somehow try to produce um, a new comprehension of a certain issue that is of interest to us. In this case, for example, the role of electricity and its subversion in the production of the nation state. Um, in a way, after the exhibition itself is dismantled, the book develops a life of its own and uh, as somebody who is quite obsessed with books and ha owning them and collecting them and smelling them and tasting them, uh, this is something that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, 
for over it, I should show you the books. I wish I could kind of. Present to you book. Um, for over a century, electricity has cast its brilliant spell upon the Syrian landscape. In current power in Syria, we choose to place our windmill within this longer history of nation building and associated subversion of electricity. Whether in the Arab world or elsewhere, and here I, here I encourage you to think about uh, stories in Pakistan that I'm unaware of, that I suspect are very similar. Histories of electricity are histories of enchantment with that which is essentially invisible, yet marvelously materialized across infrastructures, appliances, and knowledgeable practitioners. In the book associated with current power in Syria, the history of electrified matter is told across five episodes. The first is the story of an Ottoman dream that is communicated by telegraph at the turn of the century in 1912. The second is the boycott of the tramway company that led to the Treaty of Syrian Independence. In 1935 was the boycott and the resulting strike. Independence had to be postponed until the end of the Second World War in 1944. The epic saga of the Euphrates Dam told through the experience of the late filmmaker Alma Emir Lai and the role of electricity in torture the role of electricity in torture in producing the Syrian citizen. The fifth story is that of our own collaboration to build the windmill during this contemporary revolutionary moment. Javeria? Ah, if only the coast of the Eastern Mediterranean remained a crocodile pool and electricity remained in the distance. Yet, this curse that kills people had arrived. Television, fans, refrigerators, squeezed fruit. What can be produced by electricity? Be given life. I thank God that I do not understand the secrets of that marvelous creature. If I could comprehend the usages of electricity, I would have been left numb with fear. I only knew of its uses, the tremor. Man must accept electricity. He must read but never die. We want you to say your last words. Do you have a final wish? I looked at him and did not respond. My shoulder was broken. Nothing mattered anymore. I was aware that death was a final comfort that I could achieve. Enchanted, I awaited this comfort. Torture 1975, the fourth episode from Current Power in Syria. Thank you very much. As I mentioned earlier, in June 2017, the windmill was destroyed by a Russian or regime air raid after it had been in operation for 24 months. Our plans for its replacement were suspended by the regime takeover of the Eastern Gulf a few months later. In a group exhibition at Beirut's Sursot Museum, we built a monument to the destroyed windmill, a battery. And I like very much the term battery because it implies not only the electricity generating object, but also um, uh, forms of artillery. This monument is composed of 24 cells, one for each month in which the windmill was in operation. Each cell contained a copper and aluminum electrode plate that was manually inscribed with the story of the windmill's construction and destruction. These minute etchings were magnified by the electrolyte fluid. Connected in series, the battery produced an electric circuit that illuminated a single light source for the length of the exhibition. The revolution is a mirror, or also hashtag the revolution is a mirror. Since 2016, we have produced 10,000 serialized numbered magnetic mirrors that were distributed at various exhibitions, including the Oslo Architectural Trinale in 2016, and the No to the Innovation Exhibition in Upstate New York in 2017. Those who chose to engage with our project intervened upon their landscapes by placing these magnets wherever they saw fit. They and others may visit our Instagram archive to upload an image using the hashtag, the revolution is a mirror. Today, many of these mirrors can be found in places from as far away as Tbilisi to Havana and many points in between, including in occupied Palestine, 
And I don't know about one in Pakistan yet, but I'm kind of hoping that there might be one. If there isn't, I will mail them to you. The revolution is a reflection of ourselves and all that we aspire to be. The revolution is a mirror. Our statement is written in Arabic, firstly to allude to the spectacular succession of events in the Arab world today. Events that are still in eruption since 2011 and that you've probably seen in the news in Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, and Egypt, not to mention Syria, of course. We are inspired by mirrors within telescopes and similar apparatuses. Using such instruments, our eyes transverse space, decrease distance, and push our ocular sensibilities outwards to outlying territories. Perhaps this humble magnet belongs to a similar order of technologies, a static machine through which one may capture a moment to come. The mirror has potential to instruct and corrupt. Gazing into a mirror excites the potential for evaluating our inaction and the possibilities of and for marvelous change. We believe that this mirror may act as a celebration for those who have courageously done all that they can and be an accusation towards them who have, those who have done too little in support of the popular uprisings in the Arab world. As far as the rest of us, it is an invitation to act, an anonymous aide de memoir, like a memory, uh, a reminder, one that can be misunderstood in any way they want to use fit. As they are decimated in our surroundings, these mirrors act as satellites for a revolution that is ongoing and is dependent on all of us for its collective lucidity to succeed. Omi Abiha? Yes. <clears throat> Ya Ummul Gaisi Gaisina, Valid Sauber Aina, Ya Ummul Gaisi Gaisina, Hazi Rayama Pasquina, Ya Ummul Gaisi Gaisina, Halil Matriagina, Ya Ummul Gais, Ya Ummul Gais. That is an incantation that is very, very, very old. Its origins are lost in time. The final project I would like to share with you is Birdsong. In Birdsong, we examine birds not as flesh and feathers, but rather as representations and entanglements. We assemble thus 40 birds from a long history of Syrian text and images, broadly defined. Bisma? Okay. Uh, in the Ugaritic myth of dawn and the evening star, El, the creator of men, shoots a bird and roasts upon embers. Scholars have speculated, following the birth of the voracious gods, hunting was no longer a satisfactory method for producing food. And these gods, henceforth, required food produced through agriculture, symbolized as bread and wine. The first incantation from Birdsong. Thank you very much. As for Birdsong, there are four components. The first is an exhibition that was on view at the Milan Design Journale that closed in September of last year, and that will hopefully come to New York in the coming months. It's been postponed because of COVID. The second is a second exhibition, which is very dear to my heart, at the Fat Moderia Center for Arts and Culture in Mejdal Shems, which is the largest town in the occupied Jowlan. The third is a book of 40 stories. 40 stories, of which we are looking at some of the images from this book. And fourth is a co-produced apple orchard in the Jolan, comprised of 40 apple trees, a scarecrow, a birdhouse. The birdhouse is a one to 25 model of our exhibition space in Milan. Ummi Aymun. What is a bird? What is a tree? Asked a five-year-old child born in a Syrian prison. The 34th incantation from bird song. First of all, I apologize for mispronouncing your name, but thank you. Apart from locating them in the, assembly, the assemblages of the taxidermist, the bureaucrat, or the butcher, the bodies of birds can also be found on the shoulders of policemen and officers. Singers on Syrian radio are likened to nightingales, and murderous jet pilots who are bombing our landscapes are imagined as powerful birds of prey. In popular painting, literature, and soap operas, poetry and bedtime stories, anecdotes and proverbs, birds are symbols of joy, freedom, beauty, and its absence. Architecturally, 
we find birds represented on the floors, walls, ceilings of temples, baths, and domestic spaces. Other birds are talismans and the proud trophies of hunts and my grandmother's dinner table. In our book, we organize the birds into a structure provided by a popular song recorded by the Syrian singer Asmahan in the early 1940s. The complete song, Nashid al bird song, acts as a table of contents for our project. Committed to storytelling as an act of testimony, our presentation of these songs are not recitations of facts, but rather incantations of wonder. The poetics of bird representations challenge our abstract understanding of time and space and their production. Bird, project, bird bodies shift scale across territories, both vertically and horizontally, and disrupt nation states and borders, the local and the global. In their movement, they also articulate a temporal, what I call a rhythmic diffusion. Such commanding of space and time is sensual, effective, and arguably translatable. Sarosh, please. One day, I fell in love with a boy who was in love with birds. He could distinguish birds from their song. I shared this with my friend Ali. Ali said he could distinguish bombs from the sounds they made falling on Beirut. The 18th incantation from Birdsong. <coughs> Thank you. In 1967, the Syrian territory of the Western Jolan was occupied, causing the displacement within one week, one week, of 95% of its indigenous population. The Israeli militia, the military, and their associated militias destroyed 340 villages and farms, 340 in the space of one week, leaving only five standing today. Majd al-Shams, Ain Qinya, Mas'ade, Rajar, and Buqata. Colonial settlements and kibbutzim were built over our villages, often using the same stones, and control was exerted over our land, means, and resources. For over five decades, the usurping state has tried to apply its jurisdiction and its, and its administrative laws upon this land and the population which continues to refuse this occupying power. Today, the population, which numbered to be around 20,000 today, there were 7,000, I think 4,000 or 7,000 in 1967 and are 20,000 people today. Today, this population is primarily stateless, mostly forgotten, yet archetypical of the contemporary Syrian condition of struggle against systematic violations of basic rights, geographic appropriation, home demolition, and state surveillance. Since 2011, many in the Jolan have chosen to participate using their modest means in the popular uprising occurring throughout Syria. In their courageous practices, we find affinities with our own extremely modest interventions at Sijid. We find that our struggle against multiple forms of injustice and aggression are one. Denied access to groundwater, it is in the planting and cultivation of rain-fed apples that Jawladis have expressed their commitment to survival, resistance, and attachment to the land. So I just need to somehow, I feel that I need to clarify this. So they are not allowed to collect water in tanks. This is illegal by Israeli law as a way to collectively punish everyone. And so the only way in which they can sustain themselves is through rain-fed agriculture. Namely, because the rain falls from the sky, there's actually the, the, the tree itself is what collects the, the rain. And so they grow mostly apples. Uh, they grow very well in this particular climate but also cherries and other fruit. In our intervention near Mas'ade, we planted 40 trees that will bear fruit in a few years time. Rather than providing immediate results, an orchard is an asset towards a longer term collective future. Using our own hands and disciplinary training, it was, it was our aspiration to build a small house and a garden, a house in this occupied territory. In January 2019, we built a birdhouse in Beirut, which was then smuggled to the Jolan. Since our own bodies are denied the right towards the territory, architecture and its avian inhabitants, the birds, are our representatives. Together, we choose to challenge the constant aggression associated with our corrupt regimes and the occupying Israeli forces. On the same plot of land is a scarecrow. 
In the Jolan and other parts of Syria, the practice of children carrying a scarecrow in a procession continues to this day, as it has perhaps for thousands of years. What the children do is they move from house to house with an effigy, um, singing a song or an incantation, which is the one that um, our friend read to us a moment ago. The scarecrow is known colloquially not as that that scares birds, but as the mother of rain, Emil Reith. I don't know what the Urdu for scarecrow is. I would, I would be very happy for you to teach me. But in Arabic, or one of the Arabic words for scarecrow is Umm al the mother of rain. So it's not the thing that scares birds or scares crows, but actually the thing that attracts rain. This is an early 20th century image of this, uh, this practice. The popularity of the scarecrow cannot be measured by criteria of efficacy. Along with a romanticized hearth, tomb, totem, and temple, I'd like to argue that the scarecrow also belongs to the genesis of design. It is a, hence a representation of the ongoing imagined confrontation between man and nature. As an incantation of hope, the scarecrow is an everyday monument that constitutes the center from which all culture emanates. So I'll be concluding now. As a conclusion, I would like to formulate a few thoughts on the body of the work that I presented you to you today. Our work is committed to design as a discipline and to historical rigor and method, married with somewhat naive political conviction. We believe that it is a historical moment such as the ones in which we find ourselves today that understandings of past struggles becomes most vital. Hope, we believe, is the only valid political position available to most of us today. As the late Syrian playwright Salallahu Anus wrote from his deathbed, hope is a sentiment to which we are all collectively condemned. I'll read that statement again because I found it so profoundly moving. Hope is a sentiment to which we are all collectively condemned. You recognize that we, the all, condemnation, and hope, these are all very ambiguously defined within the statement. It is within this ambiguity of condemnation and hope and of who we are, that we seek to position ourselves in our work. As a collective, we ask, how can architecture forge new ways of building in according with the circumstances of the contemporary Arab context? If representations and images express a human anxiety about death or being forgotten, we wonder if the scarecrow, the windmill, the well or a mirror are expressions about our anxieties towards life. These ideas are essential to our comprehension that design disciplines are not only problem solving practices as we are taught, as many of us are taught at university, but rather that their efficacy should be measured by other criteria, not by contemporary criteria of success or failure, elegance or vulgarity. Design like alchemy is a sincere practice of informed living, not a method of generating capital. As a collective practice, Sigil, along with our collaborators, firmly believe in the necessity of exploring design as a radical form of being and making, one that aspires towards the revolutionary moment in which we have all unwillingly, I must add, found ourselves.
Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you. It's hard to know that it ends when I'm the only one speaking, but thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry it took longer than I thought it would. Thank you so much. Thank you, Khaled. Um, really appreciate it. Can I please request um, perhaps the students, is that okay, Khaled? Do you think that everyone should turn on their videos and yeah, please. mute their mics, yes. Um, thank you, that was really quite special. Um, and although I have seen it on a couple of occasions, every time I see it, I feel like a child kind of learning all about it again. Um, and I'm also happy to see some sort of newer interventions. The battery, for example, for me was uh, not something I was aware of. Um, but maybe I can um, start with um, just a <coughs> few um, um, observations, maybe provocations, um, and maybe also very much use that as a way of welcoming um, our students, our co-presenters to participate. Um, so the scarecrow, the windmill, the well and the mirror. Um, what I love about these projects is really that they are not the, um, they are not the museum, the house, the institution, and you know, they are not the kind of high monuments, uh, but as you call them, the monuments of the everyday. They actually are the, the everyday artifacts of life that just because of our current crises, because of the moment we find ourselves in, a scarecrow is most certainly now a monument. Um, a windmill becomes a monument. So it's this kind of, um, it's it's what it's really what you said, which again is very powerful. That this is not this is a moment almost thrust upon us, right? That this is a moment that we find ourselves in um, more than um, more than something that somehow we created or generated or want to be in. Um, and so there is very much this sense of the everyday that is just to, to the capacity to carry on life. Um, itself is a monumental feat and all of the kind of normalizing elements around it, the windmill, the well, the mirror and the scarecrow become monuments in the process of doing that. Um, and and so here I, f I feel like um, um, it also is something that gives an immense amount of hope because in a strange way, while of course your representations, your writings, your exhibitions are things that are incredibly uh, beautiful and difficult to reproduce, um, the act of, of making a well, the act of making a windmill, the act of, of, of playing with that little mirror are things that everyone can participate in. And, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about this uh, capacity of your work to on the one hand, engage with people, with everyday, a kind of replicability, a kind of reproducibility, which is very, very much, um, I think, deliberate. And then on the other hand, um, the part of the work, which I think is, um, is, is uh, where you probably aspire to a certain kind of art. Uh, wow, Sarosh, a huge question. Uh, first of all, I just noticed on my fourth wall, so to speak, one of my mirrors. So if in case you were wondering what they were like, this is it. Um, so also very small. Um, so Raj, your, your question is very complex and convoluted somewhat, and it's difficult to answer. I just wanted, I, I just feel that there's something that I feel I need to emphasize, which perhaps didn't come across as clearly as I would like in my talk is that there is a certain exuberance and excitement that uh, one feels in relationship to the spectacular or the monumental. You know, when you think about the kinds of architectural programs that you mentioned, 
or the kind of programs that we would find in El Coqui or some other glossy, glossy type publication. There's a certain like as architects, we all feel very excited and short of breath as we're going through these, looking at these sections and these photographs. And that kind of exaltation, exuberance, um, overwhelmingness that we associate with finer works, greater works, monumental works, is something that I believe is not only uh, is not exclusive to the monumental and to the monument. I, I kind of feel, and this is something that is really informed by my own kind of work in art history, it's really about our own relationship to the work that is at stake. There's nothing particularly, there's rarely something particularly great about the thing that we are looking at. It's really our own kind of projection, so to speak, you know, like I, I really, I really believe that it's kind of like our eyes kind of like bleeding out into the thing rather than the thing oozing in towards us, as opposed to what modern science teaches us. And there's something about that kind of possibility, potential, that is of, at stake here. I feel that all of us have mirrors. All of us sit in front of our mirrors every day, we hope at least twice a day brushing, and we examine ourselves, and we feel and we recognize certain things about ourselves, and we talk to ourselves, no, hey, you shouldn't have spoken to your child that way yesterday. And actually, you look very nice today. You should just button up the top button kind of. And that kind of emotional relationship to the architectural object is the one that I'm trying to bring forth in these projects. Essentially, there is a kind of like sad, not sad, but there is an inherent component to these projects, which can be criticized, which is why I called it sad, is that there is a very conscious, particularly in the earlier projects, a detachment between the architectural object and its understanding and uh, circulation within a kind of exhibition world or within even the space of a book. I.e. people who are using the water in southern Syria have no idea that neither I nor Sejil nor these books nor the Venice Binale exists. In a way that is intentional because it's not, I, I'm, I'm also very wary of the architect character who acts as some kind of savior towards people who are in distress. My commitment is towards the tools of my trade. And this is something that you and I share and we've discussed many times. But the tools of my trade are the making of building, even if the building is only six and a half centimeters in plan, and the production of representations of building, such as the banner that was in, in Venice or these books. And it's only within my commitment towards my actual tool that, some, that part of this kind of unraveling, untwisting between what is monument and what is everyday can actually occur. Um, I don't think that answers your question, but I try to address some of its elements. Yeah, that does. Um, yeah, the kind of anonymity that the work offers with, uh, with where, where it actually participates in the everyday, right? I think that that is um, part of the answer. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, um, I'm sorry if we didn't say this enough, but we very much welcome questions from um, the audience and also, of course, from our participants here. There must so, be a question. So um, I'm, I'm going to uh, indulge you a bit further, Khaled. Um, so I want to hear a little bit more about the idea of history, storytelling, and myth. Because I think that this, this making of stories, right, is uh, what in architecture we call narrative. But really, it's, it's storytelling. And somehow, um, you know, this idea that uh, stories are not ever dead, that stories are always present, stories are actually very poignant, very powerful ways of uh, contemporary critiques on, 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 um, of, of, of life, but also stories that actually then give us hope. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak to the use of story or narrative as a as a weapon as as a is really a, a or maybe maybe a weapon is too lofty 
as really a tool of uh, of thinking. Yeah, let uh, lofty is unfortunately, as we both know, is not uh, not something that I find problematic. Lofty and weapon are both good. Stories are lofty, and stories are weapons. Um, to be perfectly honest, this is something that's developed across the project. It begins with excavating the sky, but I find it to be most personally most kind of profound and meaningful within the last project in the in Birdsong with the 40 incantations. And I very consciously now choose to call them incantations rather than stories or myths as a way to somehow underline that while they are how do I put this? While they are factual, as, it, as i.e. they are historicized, they belong in time and space, and there's authors to some of them. Some authors have been lost. The author is not so important to me. But while they are factual, they are not recitations of fact. They are actually attempting to do something else. And what they're trying to do is very different, I suspect, from what a lot of the ways in which when I sort of attend architectural juries, uh, a lot of us speak about narrative and the role of narrative in architecture. Here the, here the incantation is part of our, to use your term, uh, weapon, efficacious weapon towards our relationship to things that are around us. And, and, and in a way, these incantations are very much, they occupy the spaces of our everyday. You know, they are not, you know, we are surrounded by them. We just, I think in many ways, haven't paid, in my opinion, as architects, haven't paid enough attention to their revolutionary quote unquote potential in the production of space and at the time like this, the transformation of time since we are in a revolutionary moment. And, and also what's, um... I mean, it's, it's that, but it's also much more than that because somehow the Syrian cosmonaut and the scarecrow now s suddenly occupy the same, um, the same position, the same place on, yeah, on the know, canvas. And, and I, know, I find that also very, very beautiful. Well, you're my friend, so you're forced to be kind to me, but- um, not, nece not necessarily. Not necessarily, not especially not you. <laughs> um, yes, you know, there, there's a part of me that imagines them as a bookshelf. You know, it's like on the bookshelf, great works of literature and whatever I picked up on the sidewalk sort of occupy the same space. And time has this ability to somehow make value not even make value. I think, again, it's in the behold, it's in the eye of she who's reading that the value somehow operates. Right. But, um, but yeah, it's very important to somehow try to, because we, we, like, whether Syria or India or Pakistan or the U.S., these are very complex geographies, some more complex than others, I would argue, that have very contested histories. And those histories are, as we'll talk later today in class, the, those histories are very much histories of contestation and subversion of what the idea, the imagined idea of what the state should be. History is seized. And I think that as architects or as people who, who uh, you know, what, what's the word, like speak incantations, who sing. You know, imagine like this, the position of song in our life. Is a song the space of the everyday or is it the space of the monument? I would argue that it occupies exactly that threshold. When it's Madonna singing, then potentially it's not a monument. But it's exactly that space where it is both that I am particularly interested in. Right, right. Think about the position, think about the place of worship or divinity within our everyday life. This is another very good example, I think, religion as a student of, of the material culture of religion. Think about the material culture that we often associate with religion and the spaces it occupies in our imagination and in our, in our environments. Those are the actual kind of forces that I'm trying to tap into within these projects. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dara here have, has a question, please. Yeah. Okay, so from whatever I gathered, I felt like there was, um, like you mentioned, 
they were the four things, the bell, the mirror, the scarecrow, and the windmill. And obviously we're coming from a background of architecture and art. And then the, the way this was presented, it felt like, like we talk about storytelling. Um, I felt like, like you mentioned divinity and you, you mentioned everyday life and you, you're interested in understanding where they come together. It's almost like the way we dehumanized everything, the process of humanizing it and making it, making, finding a way to connect. So like when I became part of this, now it's not Khalid or Sarosh, it's Zara from Karachi talking about something that Khalid thought of and connected to your history that happened in Syria. Or, you know, there's like this connection I, I felt that was created through the way this was presented and in um, involving the, the elements of the earth. So it's almost like it connected me on a human level to these things that I had, I would have had no value for like the mirror or the windmill or, you know, in all of this. So it, it was interesting for me to see that you chose these particular items, whereas in architecture, like in, ar like in architectural terms, these would not even, we wouldn't even talk about these things as something that we could relate to. So I think that um, what my question would be that is, was that the intention? Like, am I getting it right, number one? And number two, what was the intention behind picking these particular things apart from whether it was, I wanna understand whether it was just the history of that space and place, uh, but whether it had something to do with um, your personal experience in this process. Wow, Zahra, another profoundly beautiful question that I can never do any justice to. Um, obviously, it's a provocation. Um, it's a provocation fundamentally to A, to help us conceive of architectures other than the ones in which we are, you know, bashed into our head in architecture school and to imagine architecture otherwise, differently. An architecture that is somehow uh, committed towards ideas of, of belonging and partnership. You know, it, you start by talking about Khalid, but you know, the, the, the myth of the single architect at his desk, you know, drawing is, I don't know when that was disrupted, like never happened. <laughs> You know, architecture is always a collaborative, collective effort. And in a way, I am very lucky because I have very talented and beautiful people within the core group of Sejil who are able to help me imagine these projects. And then we have these spectacular collaborators that are on the ground in Syria, so to speak. And then there are audiences and readers and participants in Zoom talks and readers like yourself. And what I hope to somehow communicate is A, how artificial, how artificial, but also how malleable this kind of relationship between monument and the everyday capital A architecture and small A architecture is. And I would like you to think about, and I speak this, and I say this with a very professorial tone, I would like you to think about which one of them is the capital A and which one is the lowercase a. Uh, and to imagine also forms of partnership, comradeship is what us like, you know, like former Marxists or still Marxists like to call it. Like this is about an international relationship, partnership that exists. I hope that you will go back home or you are at home, but I hope that you will stay at home and somehow feel a new kind of recognition vis-a-vis -vis this thing called Syria that you see on the news every day. Much like I now have a new, if I was to be told about how your grandmother prepared chicken or what kind of bird sort of visits her garden or the kinds of overlaps between the kind of crazy infrastructural project that the state has produced in the 70s in Syria that drowned entire villages and areas of the country and those that are happening in Pakistan and the role of the military and the role of the elites and the landed gentry in actually keeping us, by us, all of us here, you know, like we are all very privileged people, but we, because of our privilege that comes with a certain degree of responsibility vis-a-vis -vis 
the larger world that we live in. And I, and I suspect that this is really Sarosh's sort of like overarching umbrella in his class, and which is probably why he also invited me to speak today. It's about trying to imagine new kinds of relationships between different individuals and, and the production of new partnerships and friendships and comradeship, et cetera. I don't know if I, 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 I kind of feel that I botched your question, but I suspect I answered at least some of it. No, you did. It, 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 it makes a lot of sense. Like when the last part, like right before I asked you the question, you, you talked about divinity and, you know, monumentally, mon monumentality and our position in all of this. I actually kind of drew two circles that kind of come together in this one place where in that one place you kind of start imagining this relationship to all that we are so just trained to see and uh, assume and these stereotypes that we have right and so like when I went through like when you went through your presentation at the end of it um, you're right like I don't see Syria the same way and I've become so immune to seeing it as like, you know, like when the, like, you know, when the space person you showed, sorry, I, I forgot the name. Um, that was like, wow, like, I don't, I've never thought of Syria like that. I didn't know that there was this a person from Syria who went into like doing such things, right? Like all I know of is Aleppo. I, want, I know about the war. I know about all of those things, but this kind of, relationship is is almost like i mentioned earlier it, it's humanized it for me it's made it relatable for me i can understand it so much better from my own perspective as a human being so thank you thank you i, I just want to add something about the religion and divinity here which is I, I must confess there's a certain perversiveness on my part in trying to evoke the divine and the religious, or the mythical, whatever you want to call this otherworldly space. Um, I, again, I am a student of, of medieval magic. That's what I'm writing my dissertation on. I am pretty, I'm a historian of Islamic art. Like, you know, I think about Islam and its relationship to material culture every day, unfortunately. Um, and so there is something about, but there's something I recognize, which is a certain power that we associate with the spectacular with the divine that I really feel is actually exists amongst us. You know, this is, if you think about, if you think about the, the, the airplane for me is a very good example because the airplane occupies this space, which is the space of the sky where according to many traditions is where divinity exists. And then you have this other spectacular thing, which is like this metal flying can that then is dropping fire on you. There's that space of the air, it's, it's, it's very easy to conceive of it as being otherworldly and the place of power. But I would like to argue, and I, and I, and I hope that part of what I present to, to you today somehow somewhat convincingly argues that the space of power actually is on the earth, if not within its deeper surface. You know, that is why when you think about your typical monument, the monument is, excuse the term, but it's a phallus that's pointing upwards into the sky, trying to participate within this larger otherworldliness. The well is the same monument, but thrust into the ground, an act of reproduction, if you allow me my sense of vulgar poetics. One in which by going into the earth, I claim to locate the real source of power that the sky somehow tries to emulate produce it's again it's very vulgar it's rough poetics but i'm just trying to somehow remind you that this power that we associate with the flying man or his flying uh, machine is actually a product of our relationship to it which is a relation that's particularly difficult to think about when he's killing you from the sky like you know you know like i understand why this comprehension is difficult to make when one of your primary relationships to this machine flying above you is one of killing. But it seems that gods and flying machine are the forces that exist in the world that and, and, gov and bad governments and occupation that somehow try to, in a very banal way, uh, monopolize the control over 
uh, are killing and essentially are living. And that's also part of the spaces of which I'm trying to operate. We have, um, maybe this is uh, a good segue into uh, a question here from the audience. Um, unfortunately, it's from an anonymous attendee. I would love to know who it is. But um, it says, uh, and maybe you already answered this partly, uh, but it says, don't you think this is like creating a spectacle if it is a form of protest that does not involve um, the one suffering. So I, I don't know how to interpret the question, but I, I suspect- I, I, I could try. Yeah, if, so. if, if I, I understand the term spectacle as both the thing you are seeing, not, not both, not both, both three things, as the thing that you are seeing, the actual way of seeing it, the technology of seeing, and the thing that is being seen. That is what a spectacle is. In many ways, it is very similar to the festival, to the monument. In many ways, these words are unfortunately quite interchangeable for me within, within this context. Uh, the second half of the question, does it have to involve suffering? This is one of the great philosophical questions of our species. Can we actually get anywhere without being hurt? As all of us who have either eaten too much or have fallen, fallen in love with someone that we shouldn't fall in love with, it is, seems very difficult to actually achieve the kind of sentiments and projection upon the world around us without a certain degree of suffering. Don't take my word for it. Like this is a question that we have evidence that humans have been grappling with for thousands and thousands of years. And so I don't have an answer. I suspect, and this is also where I resort to my almost like old fashioned Marxism, that suffering is necessary because suffering leads to, to conflict. And when conflict occurs, change can begin to happen. There is a necessity to conflict. Now, the argument that one should always make is how much conflict is necessary? Like, you know, in Syria today, we have at least, I don't know, 200,000 people who are underground in, in dark prisons who are undocumented. We have at least 1 million people at the bottom of the, of the Mediterranean Sea. We have at least 2 million people who have been displaced from their homes within Syria. Another 2 million people who are displaced throughout the rest of the world. Like this is a sizable, um, you know, it's like we're talking about four or five million people who are, who are um, experiencing pain at a degree that we never could have conceived, I, I personally could have never conceived of before. Is the suffering necessary? Of course not. But this is part of the problem of uh, being condemned to hope. There is a certain combination. We are condemned to live in this time and be subjected to these forms of violence. And there is something about that condemnation that should move us to act in a particular way. This is where the naivety, I'm sorry I get excited when I talk about this, but this is where the naivety of our position somehow lies. Yes, it's very easy to imagine how this, how what I presented to you today is not a valid mass political project. It's not supposed to be. If anything, it hopes to address 70 students in Karachi within the space of a Zoom and hoping that when they read or hear about the sufferings of any one of their brothers and sisters, whether in Syria or down the street from where they live, they might actually think of the role of architecture. That's beautiful. Um, I'm, uh, uh, so unfortunately, we are running out of time and we're going to have to wrap it up, but we'll take one more question from uh, Zoya Nasser. And she says, uh, I was wondering about your thoughts on the symbolism of architectural intervention in spheres that traditionally don't come under the idea of architecture, such as ensuring the natural cycle of ecology to be maintained through the planting of birdhouses. Like this isn't something that one would associate with the field of architecture, yet it seems to be a necessary action. Thank you very much, Zoya. I, I kind of feel that this is really something that we've spoken about quite a bit already. Uh, but I just want to kind of add that as architects, me and my colleagues in Beirut, our aspiration was to build a house. 
you know, we would love to build a house in a garden in the Jolan. Unfortunately, the scale of our house is one that is not permitted. Unfortunately, we cannot sort of build a house in Beirut, pick it up, and sort of move, smuggle it into the Jolan. So all we were capable of doing, which I must confess at a huge amount of difficulty and cost to everyone, is the building of a small scarecrow that was literally smuggled across. It is small, I agree. The stick is quite, it's more than human size, but, but it also is a house. It just doesn't happen to be a house in which the occupants are people. The occupants are, peop are, 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 are active, are active bodies with another form of agency that are also subjected, and this is where your use of the term ecology might be interesting, that are also subjected to a whole series of different violences that we as people have perpetuated. The bird probably doesn't recognize the difference between an Israeli hunter and a Syrian hunter, but there is a distinction to be made between a comprehension of a bird that is the product of a long, 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 thousands and thousands and thousands of years in relationship to that landscape. And I'm speaking, and I'm speaking as a, a filthy modernist here, and one of a colonial nation state that was founded in 1948. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, so we're going to wrap up and I'm going to request that uh, those who are Sumaila. part of the I'm, I'm going to read Sumaila's note at the end because it's beautiful. But but uh, I'm just going to request that we assemble in maybe maybe um, five minutes in, in our Zoom session for the seminar. Uh, but really, thank you, Khaled. Can't thank you enough. And I want to read Sumaila's note because I think it should be read. So. Um, no question here, but just wanted to say that this has been an immensely thought-provoking talk, so important to discuss and extremely different from the previous presentations and talks. So again, really on the behalf of everyone at IVS, um, thank you so much. Thank you, Sumaila, and thank you all faculty and students at IVS. This has been a real pleasure. One last thing, Saraj. Part of the wonderfulness of Zoom is that we can actually communicate in this way. And this is something that we all should be taking full advantage of as the violence of COVID is raging outside our homes. Um, please reach out to me if you wanna talk about any of these issues again. As you see, I tend to ramble. I will probably be carrying my child as I do it, but I'd be very happy to talk to anyone who's attended today to, to discuss more of their experiences of this talk and their, their own work. So thank you very, very much. Thank you all. Thank you so much. <laughs>